Hey, hey. All right, so uh, a little bit about myself. This is my dog, Bimper. He's dressed like a bee here. I always do this slide. This is my wife, Orit. She is not dressed like a bee here. I am a co-collaborator in Node.js, which means I work on it. Uh, I am also a core team member in Sinon, uh, Mobex, Bluebird, and a bunch of other stuff I'm not showing here. I really like uh, promises, async await, and debugging code. And I teach high school uh, once a week. Awesome. Mm. Right, uh, I wanted to give a shout out. There is a Node conference uh, for the first time in Israel. Those of you who haven't heard about it, it's on March uh, 3rd, like, check it out. It's, it's worth uh, checking out. Cool. Tickets available on right, so yeah, tickets, I think. I don't know. So when I started doing these slides, I wanted to build Node on top of Hermes, which I haven't said what it is yet. Uh, and I ended up with a lot of C++ compilation. And I figured out coming to a room of JavaScript or like uh, developers and just showing them me doing C++ live coding for 30 minutes isn't fun. So we're going to skip that and going to do uh, something fun instead. Uh, right, so uh, today we're going to talk about Hermes. Hermes is a JavaScript preprocessor and a JavaScript engine. It's built by Facebook for React Native for Android specifically. That's the only platform it runs on right now. And you can obviously like build it locally. Uh, and the question is, why? Why uh, did Facebook do this uh, big engineering task and build a whole JavaScript engine? I mean, JavaScript is a big language now. And they actually had to implement the whole JavaScript specification, classes and everything. Right, so today we'll cover what is JavaScript? What is Hermes? Platform versus engine. Interpreter versus compiler and what are the trade-offs in a JavaScript engine that led Facebook to the decision uh, to build their own? And uh, maybe, 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 if we'll have a minute, uh, we will actually compile Hermes, and we will show how to integrate it with a platform like Node. And, uh, and what, what it entails. Cool. So let's get started. So JavaScript is the most popular programming language. Who here in the room is a JavaScript, like writes primarily JavaScript in their job? Woo, so most of us. Awesome. Uh, everything in JavaScript is an object, except for like these seven things. <laughs> who, who can name those things? There is no need to name them, just raise your hand. Right? Who, who can name five things that are not objects in JavaScript? Who here knew that everything in JavaScript is an object, uh, other than the few things? Awesome, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, undefined is one of them, cool. Uh, so JavaScript is dynamically typed, which means variables can actually change their types. That's very different from some other languages. I can do var x equals 5 and then assign it to a string. And it's lexically scoped mostly. Uh, so lexical scoping is a programming language term that basically means things are based on a position. It means that I have this x here. Uh, I can always go up and look in the same source file, like myfile.js, and find x up there. This, uh, this is mo what like, most of us know for coding, uh, like for coding scoping. It just basically means I can look at a source file and I can figure out where the variables are and the variables don't appear out of nowhere. Now, dynamic scoping is the opposite. Dynamic scoping means that the scope can change uh, based on what I have, uh, like different statements on the screen. One big example in JavaScript is the with statement. Those of you who haven't seen it, good. Her Hermes doesn't do this anyway. Uh, but it's basically the opposite. It, like, x here can either come from the object itself, or it can come from anywhere else in the lexical scope, or another width, or anything else. JavaScript is a lexically scoped language, which means you can always tell where everything is coming from, except the this keyword, which is infamous, right? Everyone here uh, who learned JavaScript probably knows uh, that this is something you have to tackle, and the width statement. And there are a few other stuff that's like the asterisk here, that's like uh, arguments and some other uh, stuff. But JavaScript is mostly lexically scoped. And this is important, and we'll get to why. Great. Uh, a JavaScript engine is something that runs JavaScript in general. That's uh, it. V8 is the most popular JavaScript engine today. It's the thing running your JavaScript in Chrome, Node, and soon Edge, uh, Opera, most of you have used V8 in one capacity or another. That's cool. Uh, the APIs you're used to using in a browser, like fetch or like set timeout, or like 
query selector are not actually a part of JavaScript. So if you do set timeout, that you are not writing JavaScript. You are writing uh, either DOM, like the, the browser API, or Node, the Node Timers API. And we have a, a different timer API than the browser. We return different things than the browser. The browser returns a number. We return an object. Uh, there's actually different APIs. And the important part is that those things are not JavaScript. They're not part of the JavaScript specification. They're not written or implemented or uh, done by the same people. JavaScript is defined in the ECMAScript specification. It's an open standard. Uh, it's a process you can participate in in GitHub or in a mailing, the mailing list or in person. But it's a very clear and specified thing. Uh, the platform is not. That means uh, Node can just, like the, the process for adding an API to JavaScript is a very clear and straight like uh, stage process. The process of adding an API to Node is you basically make a pull request. Sometimes you talk about it. Sometimes there is some discussion. Sometimes it takes like two or three years, but uh, it's, there is no clear process. And for the browsers, uh, there is a process in a group called WhatWG or WICG. There are standards bodies for that, and it's a different process than uh, JavaScript. You can add something to the, like a good example of this is promises. So promises were added to JavaScript only after promises were added to the DOM API, to browsers, as something called a DOM future. And it was like a political move. I can't uh, like talk a lot about it now the talk is English, but uh, it's a good example of standards bodies uh, impacting each other. The goal of a host platform, and that's something that JavaScript didn't do, uh, is to provide I.O. facilities. Like if I want to read a file, that's one API for the browser, one API for Node. If I want to do network, that's one API for the browser, that's fetch. One API for Node. If you want to do uh, timers, one API for the browser, one API for Node, one API for uh, Rhino with Java, for example. Uh, different facilities. Uh, fun fact, JavaScript was an entirely synchronous programming language until the sixth version where promises were added. That's the one thing we have in the language that's uh, async. Everything else, like callbacks, all the concurrency is provided by the platform. Everything is synchronous, like without the host platform until ES5, uh, ES6, sorry. Everything we did, it was asynchronous, was part of the host platform and not JavaScript. Everything in JavaScript was synchronous. It's fun, uh, fun fact. Right, and the platform provides any arbitrary host APIs. If the platform is a microcontroller and you have to turn a switch, the platform will provide a host API for that. And again, it's decoupled from the JavaScript runtime. Why is this important? It's why Node works, right? If the engine, V8, was coupled into Chrome, like Ryan couldn't uh, make the initial version of Node because it was too tightly coupled. Uh, and another example of this is Chakra. So Microsoft, before abandoning Edge and doing a Chromium Edge, that's the new Microsoft Edge, they uh, wrote their own Edge and they open sourced the JavaScript engine. And people were running that on Android, for example, because you can't run a compiler and V8 is a compiler. We'll go through this soon. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to decouple the JavaScript engine from the host platform. Right. In Node, our host platform consists of mostly libuv. That's what does our uh, events, file system sockets, uh, and some other stuff like CRS, that's the DNS library. Uh, and the engine runs the actual JavaScript. Like whenever there is a libuv a file system call that reads a file, it will always go back to V8 to read and execute your JavaScript. Now, I have a question here. Who here uh, thinks that JavaScript uh, is an interpreted or can be interpreted programming language? Who thinks it's possible to write an interpreter? All right, I see Gil here. He is brave. Anyone else? I see another. Nick, OK. Ish. Ish. OK. So the issue with JavaScript, with interpreting JavaScript, is actually hoisting. Uh, JavaScript can't actually be interpreted. Like, interpreted basically means uh, run as you go. In JavaScript, you have to parse, if you have a thousand line uh, function, you have to parse the whole function before you can start uh, running it. And the reason is, if, I, if you have a var, that's a scoping thing, if you have a var at the bottom of the function, you have to uh, know about it at the start of the function. You have to parse the whole file. In order. Yeah, you, you actually, yeah, Gil is true, is uh, correct. You actually have to parse the whole file and not just the, the whole compilation unit, if we're being uh, precise. Right. Uh, now, V8, that's the Google engine, that's the one you're like, likely most familiar with, is written by uh, Chrome, and it's a just-in-time compiler. So there is this dude called Lars Bach who wrote uh, JIT for a language called Self a long while ago, and then uh, they hired him, like Sun hired him for Java, because Java was slow and everyone was complaining about it. 
and he made Java fast. So Google hired him to work on V8 to build the JIT. And since then, that was the first uh, just-in-time compiler for JavaScript uh, called Full Call Gen. I think it was the first, or like the first good one. There was some, some like Spider Monkey, I think, was before, but it didn't work so well back then. And uh, it, it made JavaScript fast ever since then. Uh, a few very smart engineers worked on it. And the gist of a just-in-time compiler is that it will read your code and it will run it and gather statistical information about what parts are fast and what parts are slow. And there is a really important particular optimization I want to talk about. It makes the JIT fast in, in V8. And Hermes does something very interesting. We'll go uh, through it too. And uh, Facebook wrote a uh, JavaScript engine uh, called Hermes, right? So Hermes, the whole point of Hermes is they needed their own JavaScript engine. That's surprising, right? Because V8 is huge. They had a bunch of really smart people working on it. And uh, the very, like, one of the most important optimizations in V8 is called the inline cache. Whenever you run a function in Chrome, in V8, it will gather information about the shape of the object you pass to the function. So, for example, here, when you run the function a few times on the right side, uh, it will gather information about what type of object you pass in. If you always pass the same type, it will mark the function as something called a monomorphic function. And then it will cache the property access. So instead of like doing a lookup, like where is the X property of the O object, it will do a cache hit. It will figure out it has the same shape on the object. And it will just look at memory offsets on the object. And that's the, uh, I don't like the term, but secret sauce that makes V8 a fast uh, engine when doing a lot of object access. Now, on Hermes, they do something completely different. They will actually pre-process your file ahead of time and they will figure out all the property access, which means instead of figuring out the shape in runtime of the object, they will figure the shape out in compile time, and then they will just use that. So they will literally compile your code into something that looks like this, where they just know the offsets in memory of the object, uh, which is way, way fast. Uh, and that's the most important optimization in Hermes. If you have one takeaway from this talk, it's how important knowing the offsets of properties in objects are and the, uh, like the, the win in pre-processing. So the thing V8 does in runtime based on statistical information, Hermes does in compile time. Now, this is very fast in startup, right? The first time I run this function, it's already fast. I don't have to run it a few times in order to get fast startup, but it breaks, right? If this object is entirely dynamic, Hermes will break. And they're very upfront about this. They uh, say, we do not support the whole ECMAScript specification. This is a JavaScript runtime that runs a subset of JavaScript without proxies. Proxies just don't work, they never will. Like, no matter what you do, if you do something too dynamic, Hermes will just break, and that's fine. Uh, that's also true, that's just like another example. Uh, in V8, you have toString on a function. Well, that returns, unsurprisingly, the function source. In Hermes, they will never support the function source, right? because they build it ahead of time. They, they don't save it anywhere. The whole point is that parsing is expensive on mobile, so they have to do a slither work on startup on mobile. Uh, all the dead code... So one, one other important optimization compilers do is called dead code elimination. Dead code elimination will go through your code and it will just delete stuff that's not used. V8 has a really interesting architecture and it's just-in-time compiler called TurboFan, where it does transforms on your code. It will detect that there is nothing uh, connecting it builds a graph out of your program, it's a, a sea of nodes, whatever, and it will detect uh, what parts aren't being used, and it will just decompile them in that it will unload them from the memory, and it will ignore them, and it will not run code, it, no it can prove doesn't do anything. <laughs> Hermes doesn't do the same thing uh, at all. It doesn't do that code elimination in runtime, it's an interpreter, it just knows information ahead of time about the code, and uh, in Hermes, it will just not include it in the bundle. They run prepack. Prepack is Facebook's pre-processing tool. And it will just not include this code. The code will not be in the bundle. Now, V8 is pretty fast in running functions that don't run because it doesn't actually parse them. It does like a partial parse. Uh, I don't want to go into this. But uh, in Hermes, it will just not run the code at all. It will not be in the bundle. It's like tree shaking from Webpack, those of you who know it. Uh, that's the gist. Uh, another thing they do with prepack, is compile time calculation. V8, if you have a function that does this a million times, uh, V8 will do it once, and then it does something called constant folding. It will calculate uh, 
it, it, it will see that the uh, calculation repeats itself. It has the same dependencies and it's local. Like it doesn't escape with uh, dynamic scoping anywhere and it will just cache it. It will know this is uh, 45. In Hermes, uh, they will do this uh, in compile time. So 30 plus uh, 15 will never exist in my code. And it, like uh, it just, it will just be const foo equals 45 in compile time. Uh, so they do a lot of these sort of optimizations. And uh, another one is string interning. So those of you who don't know, if you have a string and it repeats in a few places in your source code, it will actually go into a special pool of strings that get reused, so it doesn't have to allocate or like do an equals check every time. And V8 does this really smart thing, representing uh, strings as trees, which makes concatenating strings faster, and it just collapses them back into con like a sequential memory when it has to. It's different, by the way. Every engine does something different. Like for example, Firefox uses a data structure called ropes for strings. Hermes doesn't do any of that. It does, it does intern strings, it detects strings that are constants in the source code, and it will put them on the side and put them in a pool, but it will not do any clever representations of strings with ropes or any of the clever stuff. Uh, so the gist of it is even though JavaScript has some uh, dynamic parts, Hermes always assume, le assumes lexical scoping to perform uh, work ahead of time. And this is a really important point because lexical scoping is the reason we don't have this in React hooks, right? So it's not just, this sounds like a language level implementation detail, but the reason the hooks API looks the way it does in React for React Native for Facebook is because the hooks API doesn't have this. And it's not that it's a, it's a bad API, it's because tools like Hermes and like uh, uh, Prepack just can't process it because they can't prove in many cases that the value is from where it comes, uh, which means they can't do calculation ahead of time, uh, which forces the API. So the whole point of Hermes is like taking this big Facebook theme of doing stuff in compile time and taking it to the next level, trying to do as much work in compile time as possible with their API specifically designed to be lexically analyzable. It's good for IoT and mobile which is another important takeaway, right? In IoT, parse time is a killer. You will wait like uh, 10, 15 uh, seconds sometimes for an app to load, like a large app. And Hermes is really good with this, with not waiting for uh, like a lot of time uh, when running an app. And that's the major selling point. That's basically why they did it. And it's not ready, right? So building Hermes is not fun. Not really. I, I, I built it. I played with it. It's not, if you don't really like, uh, like fighting the C++, there is like, uh, like struggling with the build. Why isn't it working? Like the paths are incorrect in the readme and I had to build it and I had to do a bunch of, uh, open a bunch of issues about stuff that didn't work. And to be fair, everything I opened, they fixed in a day. So they're like, including missing JavaScript features. They literally like, Hey, you're missing this feature in JavaScript. Okay, cool. And they just like edit it. So, really fast, but not entirely ready. This is a great project to try to understand the trade-offs of uh, optimization versus, uh, uh, like just-in-time optimization versus compile time optimization, but it's not ready for production yet. Uh, don't use it except for fun, and it is fun. <laughs> right, so how does it basically look today? You check out the Hermes repo, right? There might be something faster. This is what works for me. You do build LLVM. LLVM is the low level uh, virtual, like the, the bytecode. And that's like, does the C compiler, then they do a configure, uh, CD build and Ninja. Ninja is the meta build system. If you don't know what Ninja is, that, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, there is a guide about, it's like the Google tooling for build. Then you include the compiler driver. That's the thing you include to run the compiler. And then you install any dependencies you do, you want, like brew install libuv, you run it, and uh, I have, if anyone cares, you can ping me and I will upload the version of this working with a set timeout API with libuv. Uh, it's fun. Right. Uh, I don't want to look at the repo, that, that's a bit scary and I don't have time. Uh, and I don't think I have time for questions, unfortunately, but uh, it was fun. Uh, thank you.